We're going to go ahead and start on eligibility because we've got a few things that we need to, I want to make sure that we get, get through it. Um, eligibility is a very important piece because that determines does a child really meet eligibility? If not, then we need to might have to go another route like 504. But we just need to make sure that we do it properly right because if the state goes in and looks and sees it, you've got an SLD eligibility guide, guideline thing and you've not completed that, then they'll wonder why. So we need to make sure. But we're going to go through all of that. Okay, as you know, we've talked about this. I think all of y'all were here in that first session that we talked about the child fine. Anybody can do child fine, okay? Teachers, people off the street, board members, anybody who works in your buildings, anybody can do child fine. So if, if they know of a student that they feel like might be special ed, especially the teachers, then they need to refer those kids. But before they refer... They need to try different strategies before that because it may be they're not used to lecture all the time. I always hated lecture. Put me to sleep. But if they gave me something to do hands-on, I was all for that. Um, but we have to make sure that, you know, we, we include all types. We have homeless children. Uh, with all this flooding, all this stuff that happened to us, you know, here in the past, the tornadoes that McGolfin County has been through, you know, they were they had to go other places because they had no home it, it just went you know the wind just took it so we have to remember about all the issues that, that we're looking at all right we do have Kentucky regulation just as we do our federal regs and I'm not going to go through in depth of the regs because I know y'all can read them those types of things but your director every year most of us, so I always put it in, on the radio and I put it in the newspaper about child fine. That's a regulation that you have to do. You have to do it every day. I mean, every year. Plus, once you get the uh, newspaper, you have to cut it out. You got to keep it to prove if they come back and say, show me the evidence. You have to prove that, that you did put it in the newspaper or newspaper. Some people has more than one. All right, we know a better referral system that we have to do. It's really supposed to be your regular education teachers. But the special education teachers have to assist with it because sometimes, especially if you've got a new regular education teacher, they have no clue what we're doing. They have not uh, access an infinite campus to even fill out the referral. And I don't know why that's there, but they need to have access to that referral because you all end up having to redo it. Or you do it. You do it. I did it. I'm just going to be honest. I did it. Um, number one is it always falls back on us when we do our regular reviews. If you do a regular review and, and you see all these issues, you know, it, we know it's not special ed's fault, but we get the blame for it. So might as well go ahead and, and help them with it or do it for them one. Um, so we know we have to go through the referral system, and, and we have to see if the attendance might be issued. And so if it's an attendance issue, then it's lack of reading and math instruction because they're not there to get it. It's not that you're a bad teacher. It's because they weren't there to get it. And I know when it first started, I had a regular education teacher say, are they saying that I don't know how to teach? Uh, no, you interpreted that wrong. And then you have to explain that to them. But they, they get offended. Uh, so we have to make sure once we go through that referral, we have to go through the tiers. Now, I'm going to be honest, I look at some of those referrals and I look at those interventions and strategies and I'm like, those are not strategies, those are not, you know, things that we need to have on there. The dates are like all the same and it's like, these people didn't even do nothing, they just wrote this down on this paper. Um, sometimes a child don't react as well to certain strategies. And if it don't, it's okay to put over there, you know, if, it, if it's helpful or, or they somewhat learn or whatever. And if they didn't, it's fine to say that they did. But then you have to write down on the next line what you did from that date to another date. So you have to look, go through those strategies. You just can't put in there and just say, didn't, didn't make any progress. 
most kids will make some progress. May not be what we want, but they will make progress. So we have to watch what we're doing in that when we're writing out those stra the strategies and, and por parts of that referral. Um, we have to make sure that we have database. You know, we've talked all day today about data. We have to have data. We have to have baseline. We have to give sh screeners. We have to do all kinds of things. We have to make sure we know the student so we know how to write an IEP. It talks about a child with a disability. And, of course, you've got your federal regs and you've got your uh, state regs as well incorporated in that. Uh, and it, it talks about all the different disabilities. Again, Kentucky uses 14 disabilities. And some states only use the 13, and they call them intellectual disabilities. And that's your FMD and your MMD. But we separate that because we want it separated. We want to know uh, the, the different IQ because that helps us. You have children that are three through nine. You know if they qualify, they're DD. What we have found at KVAC, our KVAC staff have been out in these what we call CCEIS districts, and we are finding that the students that they are putting in as DD, most of them are coming out MMD. It's like we're dumbing them down. And I know that some kids or probably teachers kids or something that goes into this but a lot of your regular ed teachers think those are special ed kids the special ed teacher will come and get them and that's theirs well I'm sorry they're not special ed kids they are regular ed students they receive our services they receive speech you know and here you all teach them academics so it's like no, it's a service. It's like a regular education student just having speech only. They're not special ed kids. So, and I've been preaching that for 40 years. This will be my 41. I'll be preaching it when I leave here. <laughs> yeah, when I'm going out that door, I'll be saying that. So, and you'll probably hear it. But, you know, we have to make sure that they do have a develop. And I'm going to tell you, I even told the state this. I don't think DD needs to be involved in those disabilities because it's not a disability. It's the time that they play catch up. And that's the red stuff you put on your hamburger and stuff. But anyway, my grandson tells me that all the time. Catch up, I said, yeah, catch up. All right, so um, we just need to make sure that these students are really DD. You get that form, you look through it, you do it honestly. Because we don't want any more DD students to be dumbed down. And I know Denny Paul stepped in here now and he knows what I'm talking about. We're making them special ed. And we need to stop that. But it's not you all. I'm preaching to the you know, choir. You all understand what I'm talking about. Because we don't need that. And we have seen that. We've seen that issue. Autism. We have seen a, the right explode just like you all were talking about earlier and it's going to keep coming all right it's going to keep coming uh, so we, we just need to be ready for that so it tells us what autism is it's a developmental disability significantly affecting verbal and nonverbal communication and social interaction generally evident before the age of three now sometimes they don't catch it at age by age three but it's the parents have, are in the denial stage. And they don't see nothing wrong and think, oh, he'll, he'll, they'll, get, they'll catch up. But when you see they have social issues, um, you pretty much know. You know when you see the, the fl hand fluttering, those types of things, you can just make the rocking. Those types of things you can catch on pretty quick. Um, but we do have some students that rock that are not autistic. So we, just to make, we need to make sure that we go through that autism uh, eligibility form we need to make sure that we document everything that is needed and we need to document that as honestly as we can okay so other characteristics that are associated with the autism it tells us that you know sometimes they repeat things over and over and over they just repetitive um, and their stereotype movements uh, resistance to environmental change or change in daily routines and unusual responses to sensory experiences. 
Now, I have to say this. When I was a director in Breathitt County, I had a child, an autistic child. They changed the bus at the last minute. Autistic kids can't stand change. So the child, he gets on the bus. He sees that that's not his bus driver. He tells that guy that he's not his bus driver, you know, on and on and on. But instead of trying to, the teacher telling that child, now you're going to be on, I'd be walking to the bus with that child, telling that child, now there's going to be a little change here. I want to let you know right up front that you're going to have a different bus driver and you are going to be going a different route. That wasn't never said to him. So the guy, he gets on the bus and he's sitting there, and I guess he's seeing going the different route. So he gets up, and he hits the bus driver in the back of the head. And, of course, the bus driver stopped and all that type of stuff. But when it was all over with, they come back to the, the garage. The bus driver come to my office, and he told me this story. He wanted him kicked off the bus for the rest of the year because he was violent. I said, no, I know that child. He's not a bit violent. Somebody failed to tell him of the changes. Autistic kids have to be told at, way in advance if you can. And have, if they t knew it at the beginning of the day, they should be telling that story over and over and over all day long to where it's stuck in his head. But nobody did that. But it was a last minute. It was a last minute. They did not know it was going to have that change. But the teacher failed to walk the, the child to the bus and explain it on the way there. And then explain it to the bus driver because he'd had no clue about all of this. But he was uh, hot and heavy. He went up to the superintendent. He wanted the child just off that bus. Said he's violent. So, you know, what all that led into. So, yeah, I had a mess with that. But he did not have to uh, lose his transportation rights. Uh, so we, we have to make sure that we know each of these. So you have deaf blindness, and I don't know if you had this in your school, but it is, you stop and think for a minute. If you can't hear and you can't see, I think that's a horrible feeling. I can't hear out of this ear right now because my eardrum's all filled up. So if you tried to talk to me on this side and I've not said anything, it's not because I'm snotty. It's because I can't hear out of this ear right now. Um, but if we imagine that, how hard that is, you need to try to do everything you possibly can for these type of students. These are the kids that you're going to find out that's going to need all this assistive technology, all this stuff, because they don't know. They, and as they get older, I worry about them. I had one at the high school, and I constantly worried about her uh, because I knew the life that she lived and it was like I wanted to take her and keep her, but no, I couldn't. But, you know, it's, it, it's just terrible. In some big cities, those students have a lot of opportunities. But in some of our Appalachian little, little bitty, I call them little dot on the map, there's not a lot of opportunity f for those kids. And the best place that I have found for them to go to is to KSD and KSB. They have what they need there. And they can teach them up here where our districts didn't have all that to do. So uh, that's the best place for those to go. So if that ever happens in your districts, you know that that option is open for you all. Okay. When I was, in, I was born and raised in Houston, Texas. I, I know Marianne, all those know that I, a lot of y'all know where I came from. But uh, my best friend, she could not hear and she could not talk. She taught me sign language. Uh, she could write, oh, so pretty. She could write pretty. But, uh, but she taught me all this, the sign languages and all those types of things. And, and we left at the same time. When I come here, she went to Georgia. And, um, and she's still alive, and we're still talking, uh, writing. <laughs> she can't talk, so she's right. she writes me, and I write her back. But, uh, you know, uh, a hearing impairment, you know, sometimes we have cochlear implants. We've got things that, that will work. Um, and when that happens, I want to, to tell you all what I did, and it, was, uh, it went great. It, it, may, it may go wrong later, but we had a child that could not hear. They did the cochlear implants, but they did it like when he was 10. 
And, of course, you know, he couldn't talk. So what I did was I helped arrange his schedule, and I had the speech therapist as well, you know, as the hearing person together to where they could work with each other because if your speech therapist didn't know sign language, because sometimes he would try to sign. Well, if you don't know that, you know, it's awful because you, you feel like you, you don't know what you're doing. Um, but anyway, they helped, the speech helped with the language part. You know, they use the mirrors and all that to show where you put your tongue, all that kind of stuff. And it was amazing. The child talks. He's talking right now. He's at the high school level. He helps manage with the boys' uh, basketball team. Um, he still wears a little cochlear implant. But um, it worked because we all collaborated together. I don't know how I could have done it if I had them separate. I don't know how I could do it. Because if I didn't know sign language and I was a speech therapist and he started signing, I would be, oh, I don't know this. I have to get this hearing impaired teacher come in here and, sign, and interpret what he's trying to say. But anyway, we do have uh, the eligibility form for that. And I didn't pull that one. I just pu pulled the three ones that we mainly use to go over because I know we don't have much time to, to go over stuff today. Um, and this will help us for next year when we do this. We're going to make sure some of ours are going to be two and three hours long because we want you to get all of it and not just a short version of it. All right, so we have EBD, Emotional Behavior Disorder. Okay, we have some people that think that you have to have a degree in EBD. Any special education teacher can teach an EBD student. I'll tell you how I learned that. We didn't have an EB unit, EBD unit in 1984, and um, I was called to do EBD. And I was sitting here thinking, no, anybody can do that. But, of course, they wanted me to do it. And I probably was the best teacher for that because I was just like they were. I loved them. I didn't have any problem with any of them. Um, they wanted attention. They wanted affection. You know, they had issues. I dealt with their issues. I even played music low in the room to where they could hear that and keep them, you know, s smooth and all that. And then if they started to get, like, in a fight or have a verbal thing, I'd jump on the desk and dance and do all kinds of crazy things. And they'd look at me like, this woman's crazy. So, you know, they stop and laugh and carry on, and they go on. You have to do things out, outside the box. But anyway, the principal was walking by when I did that, and he said, what in the world were you doing on that desk? And I told him, I said, I just got up there and started dancing. They quit that fighting, didn't they? <laughs> so, you know, you do what you have to do. But I was young then. I don't think I'd be jumping up on that desk right now. Uh, I'd have to find some other way to, to do something. Grab one of them and start dancing with him, I guess. Uh, but anyway, uh, we have kids that are really emotional behavior disordered. Sometimes we have them in the unit and they're really not EBD. But because there's such a disruption in the regular classroom, you hear principals say, we need to put him in the EBD room. We need to. So here you're doing all this. Well... That doesn't matter because guess what's going to happen when they graduate? They're going to have this EVD label. They're going to want to go to work. They look at their school records. Oh, they're EVD. They're, they're bad. I mean, that's what people think. They're bad. No, they're not bad. We have fixed that. We've done what we can and, and gave them some strategies, even outside, like stress balls. And I'm going to be honest, we had a presentation. Oh, uh, Last week, I don't know, it was, I think it was last week, and I saw a lady, and she had, um, oh, I did see that one with the fidget, but it was that um, Play-Doh, and she would roll it down, she'd roll it up, she'd roll it down, and I knew, she was ADHD, she was trying to focus on what we were saying, and she was doing, she was, but she was doing that with her hands. So it's like, we, we all have some things. We doodle sometimes, but we hear what people are saying, but we have to be doing something. Um, so anyway, EBD, uh, we can try to help the ones that we really can't help. And, and right now we've got several trying to go into the EBD uh, category. But you know what? It's because of all these floods, all these tornadoes. All these horrible things that have happened to these kids that causes anxiety. I was over in McGolfin County, 
And it was about a year after they had that flood. And I don't know who's... I might have been in your room. Somebody, I was in a room when that girl panicked when I, it got dark outside and it started raining. Oh, Lord. Oh, I felt sorry for her. I did. I did. And she had lost her whole house and everything in that tornado. So, you know, you think... I probably would be anxious and, and, and have nervous disorders um, if something like that happened to me. I went through the flood. It did happen to me in the flood, but I wasn't a kid then. I was older. Um, but, you know, we got to stop and think of what these kids go through. You know, some of them don't even have what they call a house. They have a shack or something. Uh, no insulation. They got chickens in their house, pigs in their house. You know, people need to get out and ride around and see where some of these kids live and they can then figure it out. Some kids are raising their self. You know, it's sad. But we have to make sure when we look at that EVD eligibility that we're going by line by line and we're making sure that we're marking that appropriate box. Now, it has to be across all settings too. Remember that. So if a child comes to your room and you have no problem with that child, hmm, but then they go to another room and they're, they just act up and are horrible. You know, that's saying something. It could be that if one is a, a male teacher and, you know, they've had problems with a dad, that might be an issue. You know, you have to pick up on things and see things. You may have to change a child's schedule. Uh, the, and the teachers can sort of collaborate and say, this is what I do in my class. But if that child has a problem with a parent, you know, it don't matter which one it is, boy or girl, uh, a man, woman, we have to make sure that we help that child. And sometimes you just have a sit down and have a heart-to-heart -heart talk with them. And don't scream and carry on like some of the classrooms I've been in. Because um, they don't need that. They don't need that. But we need to make sure it's across all settings. And, and most of the time you're going to find out not. But they are some true EBD. Um, sometimes you have those kids that's been in ATV accidents and they've got this traumatic brain injury. Um, you know, and, and it's horrible. Uh, I had one of those students, and no matter what you did, you know, it's it was his brain. It, he couldn't help it. There's nothing you could do about it. So you just had to do the best that you could. And when he went off, you just got the kids out of the classroom and stayed in there with him and tried to calm him down. That's all you can do. Hard of hearing. So our hard of hearing and our, our vision have changed. Your eligibility forms have changed. They just got them out. The State Department does have them up now on their um, uh, website. Plus, it's in Infinite Campus. They've got all that new new stuff in Infinite Campus. So, it's in there. So, we need to make sure that we check that because now we can have probably more students in vision and hearing than we did in the past. And that's going to be bad, too, because some of them we, we had to exit out last year. I know of some, and now we're going to be putting them back in, so they're going to think we're all crazy. But it wasn't us that changed any of that. Um, so here is where you have your intellectual disabilities. This is your FMD kids and your MMD kids. So we know that 55 and below is your FMD, and then 56 to 70 is your uh, MMD children. So we look at those uh, the IQs, we look at their working memories, we, we look at all those pieces, that, all those domains that we give that test to. Now, the problem that I'm finding when I go in there and look at your records, I find that sometimes the FMD students might have a um, adaptive behavior of 76 or something way up there. Most of the time, well, should all the time, it should be about the same. Your IQ and your adaptive behavior should be about the same. But it could be a teacher did it that really didn't know how to do that, or they saw it, oh, they don't, they're not a problem in my classroom. They're really good, so they just give them all twos. We can't do that because we have to justify that. And I hope that you all have some kind of access. When you put that in, it will spit out the composite. And then you can look and, and see what uh, areas they did, and you're going to say, no, that child can't do that. Can't do that. You have to be able to see it to get twos on a routinely, not just once a month or whatever. And when you see all those twos and you're looking at that, it's like uh, contacting the IRS. I don't think so. But anyway, you've got to look at some of that stuff and then take it back and say, you know, maybe I need to help you fill this out. 
And then, because you don't want to go and have the child tested and then that big 76 pop in and it's like, well, we can't put that child FMD because he's got an adaptive behavior of 76. So we got to watch what we're doing and try to do it before it gets to the psych school psych. So that's just one thing that I wanted to say about that. And same thing with your MMD students. You know, if they've got a 90 adaptive behavior, you know, then it, something's wrong. So we want to try to correct that before it gets there because it's not fair to that student if we're going to score them high. We have to make sure that we see it. And we need to make sure we train our staff. Whoever's going to be doing those, they need to be trained. And we don't care one bit to come in there and do that for you all. Train them for their adaptive behavior. Because they, I'll, I'll tell them like I do tell you, if you didn't see it happen, don't know, don't, don't circle no twos. <laughs> Sound like you should have had them all took from her to start with. That's sad. That's sad. That's what I'm saying. We don't know what all these kids go through. We really don't. All right, so, yes, here we have, and I've got insert the MMD for eligibility form, and you have a copy of that. So if you'll get that out. You should have three, an MMD, FMD, and SLD. That's the ones that I uh, specifically ran off. Those are the ones we're finding problems with in our KVEC area. So we want to make sure that... Hey, Brenda, what was the IQ set for MMD? 55 can be FMD. Yeah, 55 it, can be FMD and low. Mm -hmm. So I, say, I always say 56 to 70. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. I thought somebody was stand, standing by me. Oh, there you are. I was like, <laughs> I got a ghost. Okay, here's MMD. And let's see here. Specific. Okay. All right, here you go. You, all right, here you, right, you go. All right, so let's just look at A. And does everybody have a copy of this? If not, I've got all three of them up here. It's dark right here. It's like I'm in the, I can't stand it. And I don't want that thing in my face. Oh, I got to get over here. It is. It's like dark up there. You can't see. And I got a cataract on top of it, so that don't help me none. Okay. <laughs> Maybe it won't get ripe, as they say, for a while. That's what he said. I thought about a tomato. When he said that to me, I'm like, yeah, Rick, the tomato is it ripe? <laughs> but anyway, on your uh, 1A, it talks about the ARC documents, evidence showing the student's cognitive functioning, and it leads two standard deviations below the mean. So we know our deviations are 15 points. So one deviation would be, what, 85? Two deviations would be 70. So I'm looking at that very first one. So if it's two deviations, you're fine. Okay. So you have to make sure you look at that. And I always discuss every bit of this in the conference summary. I start from that first one and go all the way through it in that conference summary. I discuss every domain that they gave, gave that child and the scores what it affects in academics, all those types of things. All right, so when you're looking at B, you've documented that evidence showing the student's adaptive behavior is at least two standard deviations below the mean. We talked about that already, right? <laughs> okay, so it says for re-evaluation purposes, it's not necessary to continue uh, to meet the two standard deviations. And why is that? We've had the child now in special ed so they're probably learning a little bit, right? So, and if that happens, now I'm not saying if it jumps from a, a 68 to a 85, there's something wrong there, okay? <laughs> but, you know, it, it will raise a couple, two points, three, you know, uh, depending on the child. But you write in your conference summary, you know, that the child has been in special education, uh, his educational history, I mean, uh, you know, all the time, for all these years. And that's the reason why the score has raised, and that's what we want. That's what we want to see. So 
We can document that. But now we don't need no big old numbers in there. Do that, you better do it again. Okay, so C, an, uh, the ARC documented evidence showing a severe uh, deficit in overall academics. Now, that's going to be your, uh, I don't know what y'all do is your academics, but look at your academic testing, see what the scores are. You'll see that they're, this is, this is Denny Paul saying this, because he used to be this diagnostician in Pikeville, uh, or Pike County. Um, if it's 78 or below, the scores in your academics, then that's the MMD range. That, that you, they'll be fine. Now, you might have an outlier here and there, but most of the scores will be, you know, the, uh, 78 or below. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I know some do Woodcock Johnson. They do all kinds of different tests. Um, and I'm, I need to tell you all this. Uh, the State Department does have the uh, SLD tables for Kaufman, all that whisk, all that. They, they didn't have it all before, but they've got them all now so you can compare the discrepancies. I'll get to that when I do that SLD one. Okay, so we've documented the evidence uh, that the disability manifested in developmental period. Uh, the ARC documented the review of analysis. Of, uh, this is where you're doing a, uh, a review of records. Uh, we have to make sure that we have adverse effect. You can't be in special ed if you don't have adverse effect. You have to have supplementary aids and services, and you have to have SDI. That's a, a, a mouthful. Okay, so we have to show how the student's performance is significantly and consistently below the similar age peer. So we have to document that. We have to make sure that's in that conference summary. We have to describe that unique <laughs> differences of the student that warrant specially designed instruction. And then we have to draw upon information from the, the triangulation of data that you're using, like you may have teachers in there talking and, and regular ed, special ed, all those things. You have to draw upon a variety of sources uh, to ensure that the information obtained in these sources was carefully considered and documented. And that is also counted uh, when you do your uh, social and developmental history with your parent. On three, the ARC documented the review and analysis of evidence concerning uh, that lack of uh, instruction. Like I was telling you before, if you find out the child has been absent a whole lot, then that is a factor to that. I know I hate to say it, but sometimes we do referrals and I'm looking and the kids have been absent 40 days. <laughs> really? Then you go back and look the year before and you're like, and you all got this child in special ed. Well, it, it's not special ed it just didn't have the instruction that it needed it just needs to go through the tiers is what it needs in the uh, RTI uh, so we have to make sure that so uh, when you're looking at all this you need to discuss these pieces in the bottom the instruction provided by qualified personnel and what I'm saying about that is teachers not aides because they don't have a certificate remember that and they can do the, the progress monitoring piece but they can't do the actually instruction uh, intervention uh, database, and I'm going to tell you, I'm going to stop right there. There are some aides that are really good and should be teachers, and then there's some that don't need to be working. Okay, so that's all I'm going to say about that. And st okay, so we have intervention database on the student's uh, response to intervention, so we need to look at all those tiers. We need to see if they're jumping from tier to tier. Are they even moving? Are there things we got to change? Those types of things, we have to write that in there. Again, it says attendance record. And when you put that in there, and that child's missed 40 days this year, 20 the last year, and all that stuff, then they're going <sighs> to work samples. Those are the best pieces that you can have. When the federal government come in on us uh, over testing, and we had scribe on some of ours, not a lot of scribes, but we had a scribe for this one particular kid, and they came in on us and said he didn't need a scribe. He said, if they could pick up a pencil, that they don't get a scribe. And I said, you could teach a chicken to pick up a pencil. Well, I shouldn't have said that because it made my director mad. But anyway, it came out before I even could, well, thought, but it did. But that's the truth. Um, so anyway, we pulled out work samples. That changed the story. So when you got those work samples, that really helps. Uh, Another thing with these disciplinary removals, we need to make sure if they do have that uh, a pattern 
going on and you've got that written down, you know, it looks like we might need some work. We might even have to write a, a goal for these kids uh, with whatever actions that needs to be uh, taken care of. So those that's the pieces that we need to put in that conference summary too. Don't forget that. Uh, the new, and I see when we were trained, they it said it, it'll be, let us have up to 20 pages for the whole entire IEP or conference summary. So we have up to 20 pages. Then expanded that. Okay, on four, the ARC documented the review and analysis of evidence confirming that limited English proficiency was not a determinant factor in the eligibility. Now, we do know that we have some children that come to us that are non-English speaking, you know, and they, they take the access. I don't know. We always give the access test. I don't know what you all give. But there's someone in your district that does give this assessment, and then they go from that assessment, and they try to make try to get that child in two years to be able to speak enough English to understand what we're doing. Um, I couldn't imagine trying to speak another language. It would take me longer than two years, my best opinion. I'd probably show them pictures. <laughs> That'd be easier for me than trying to say it. Okay. Um, and again, you see it says that this stuff could be documented in that social developmental history. That's where the parent will do that. And then if you have any uh, past or present uh, supports in the conference summary, you can put that in there. All right, so on five, the parent was provided a copy of the evaluation report and documented the eligibility determination. So after each meeting, whatever your meeting is about, your parents need a copy of that. And if it's a, a student, 18 or older, emancipated student, then we need to make sure they get a copy of that as well. So whatever that meeting is about, we need to do that. Or it says if the parent did not attend the meeting, then, you know, we need to make sure that somehow we get that report to the, to the parent. Now, sometimes we can send that by the, the student, but we need to back, you know, sometimes they, the scary part to that is to me is confidentiality. If that get lost on the bus, I never would send that to home. Okay, I just wouldn't do that. Um, I would either, either mail it, or I had a really good uh, Frisky program, and they were good about going out and delivering things for me and getting signatures and stuff. But sometimes I hear horror stories in districts, so however we can get it there, we need to get it there. Uh, we just don't want to put it on a bus uh, because we will be breaking some confidentiality if it does get lost. Uh, on six, the ARC uh, membership includes all of the following. We have to have required ARC uh, meetings, so it tells us here that we need to get that parent in there if we can. If not, get them on the phone. Uh, regular ed teacher, special ed teacher, your chairperson, and then if you have any, uh, a test uh, assessments or whatever, guess what? You special ed teachers will be doing that unless you have a psychologist in your school district, and that don't mean that person will be there. They could be testing a child at that time. So it usually falls down on us. And again, if speech only, then they usually have to talk about their, their speech tests and the things that they do good and the things that they do they need help on. Um, and then, of course, you've got your additional members. We, need, we already talked about the student. Student being there when they're 14 and up, they have to be invited when they're 14 and over. It don't mean they may show up because a lot of your FMD kids, um, they don't come to those meetings. But then you have to talk about how you uh, talked with the student prior to that meeting about all the stuff that you're talking about at that meeting, the goals and all those types of things. So you have to do that. And if they're transition people, uh, students, then we have to talk about transition. We have to look at their ILP and go over that with them. And we talk about that in the conference summary, you know, that we, you talk to the student on such and such date, and here's what we talked about. Um, so you'll have that. And then again, related service personnel, we have to remember that. I'm going to tell you I was guilty of uh, not inviting mine when I was back in the day. And then it finally hit me. Um, I think I better invite them because I got to write goals. I don't know how to write their goals. Um, so we just need to make sure we give them a copy of the, the notice if possible or if and, and t or tell them um, when the meeting's going to be. Okay, so you have that. So when you're talking, if you're doing an eligibility meeting, if you have this in your hand, you just write, write about all that. Just... <laughs> Write it all. They want to. They want to see everything. They want to see the. 
They want to see those the, the, the scores. In the past, they told us not to. You remember that? I don't know if any of y'all are here from long ago. And they said, don't you dare put any numbers in that. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, guess what? They want it all. They want it all. So, all right. Now, let's look at the FMD, Functional Mentally Disability. If I say an acronym and you all don't know it, please let me know because some of you may be new. I don't know. I, I just rattle them off. Okay, so here on A, we have to make sure that the student's uh, cognitive assessment is at least three standard deviations below the mean. So like I told you, it was 15. So if it's three standard deviations, that, that would be a 55 because that's 45. 100 minus 45 is 55. <laughs> so... We need to make sure of that. And again, the next one is all about that uh, um, having severe deficits in all your academic performance. Those scores need to be low. They need to be like 55 or lower. They may have an outlier in the 60s, but sometimes but it won't all be that way. Um, we have to make sure that it was developed in that uh, developmental period. And that, again, comes from that, uh, your, your parents' social and developmental history. Uh, the ARC documented and reviewed the analysis of the evaluation, confirming that there is adverse effect. Okay, and then it goes into the ARC. Showed how, do you see that black, dark, bold ink? Showed how the student's performance is, high, is significantly and consistently below similar age peers due to the disability and then describe their unique uh, difference uh, of the student that warrants special design instruction and draw upon information from a variety of sources. That's like I'm talking about earlier, your triangulation of data, just to see what they're doing all around. And that's even considering your social emotional pieces as well. Um, the ARC documented the review and analysis of evidence confirming lack of instruction in reading and math, again, all you have to do is look at the um, attendance records. And then it tells you here your discussion may include those things listed. Plus, it could be other any. Uh, it's not limited at all. So you have to make sure you, the, the, you have instruction provided by your qualified personnel. You have to make sure that the intervention data is based on student response to the instruction, setting of instruction, work samples, and, of course, disciplinary removals, if you have any of those. On the other side, it talks about uh, analysis of evidence confirming the, the uh, English limited proficiency. So, again, that's the same thing, and you'll find that again on that social developmental history. Um, and, and the parent will tell you all that the child, and you all will know it anyway. When he starts talking, you'll figure that out. Uh, the parent was provided a, the, a copy of the evaluation report and the eligibility determination. So we have to have those two pieces uh, and ready for them. All this has to be done. You can't say I'll mail it out to you. I mean, I know sometimes printers break up or break down or whatever. But, uh, and hopefully that's very rare. But they need that before they leave there. Okay. And talks about the ARC membership again. It's all the same. We have to have a regular ed uh, chairperson and a special ed teacher to have a meeting. And then uh, if we, the kids have related services, we need to make sure that we invite them to that. Do you have any questions about the MMD and the FMD, the intellectual disabilities? If not, I'm going to go on to the SLD. It's a little bit broader. <laughs> okay, I grabbed the second page of my. Uh, <laughs> I know these two pages of this. Okay, again, it talks about the same types of pieces, but. When you're looking at SLD, IQ plays a, a little bit in it, but not a whole lot. Uh, if you're using that as a discrepancy table, then, you know, it will. A lot of people do the discrepancy, and I would recommend that. Uh, this response to intervention, placing a child with that, 
you need to make sure you have a whole lot of data because when it comes back that three years and you do test that child and you test out, then we've hurt that child. We put them in special ed when they should have stayed in uh, regular ed. And that has happened. We've had some districts that were caught SLD. They have to retest every one of their SLD kids, and a lot of them were taken out. So, you know, how do you tell a parent that? We, we mislabeled your child. I'd be upset. So, with that severe discrepancy, like I said, and if you'll notice, uh, it's got it right there bolded. Uh, SLD reference tables, all you have to do is hyperlinked. You click that, and it'll take you to the tables. It will take you to whatever test that you gave, and it will show you the tables um, for it, which makes it great because one year we had a hard time because they only did one test, and they didn't do all of those. So everybody was having to figure that out on their own. So that, that made it pretty rough. So it's there. All you have to do is go to KDU's website, go into the monitoring, and that's where you'll find all your eligibility forms. Okay, so when you're going down to uh, SLD3, and we need to make sure of this. This is another thing that we're finding. We find that a child may be um, only has SLD and basic reading skills. Well, the next year, they've got goals for reading and math and writing and all kinds of things. <laughs> you can't do that. <laughs> Whatever. And when we come in, we have to go all the way back to that first and I'll go all the way through your folders. So we find it. So, you know, you, <laughs> again, we don't want you to do that because that's a big no-no. You get in trouble. Be put on a cap for that. So whatever their uh, SLDN, just make sure they stay that way. Now, if they're tested three years later and they test in something else plus that, then, again, you could put that on there. But don't write goals if they, you don't, they don't qualify. No, no, but, yeah, you have to do an assessment screen or something. You have to do something. You just can't automatically do it. Because you shouldn't be doing progress monitoring and anything except the goal is in the IEP to start with. But now, you'll find some. You can go to some districts and every one of them will be checked. Yes, you can do a behavior goal on a regular education child. You can have a, inter, a behavior intervention plan for a regular education child. Sure can. Uh, again, I, I want to tell you all this. In the past, for you all that's been around as almost as long as me, <laughs> uh, we used to have this saying, once SLD, always SLD. That's no more. They stopped that a few years ago. Back. back. So we do. You still have to test them. You have to have at least two tests on a child. You know that, and then you can do a review of records. But you have to have at least two tests. So if you did that uh, RTI placement, the, when you placed them, that don't count as assessment. That means you have to do two more of those tests. So that's six years there of that. So, yeah. Here we go. This is what we have to have. When a child is referred for SLD, we have to do a motor screening. It's mandated. We have to do a motor screening. If you all don't have a screener, talk to your director. We have sent them a little short screener that can be done. Uh, some districts actually have their OTs and PTs doing them. Uh, I saw that in, in some records. And that's good because they're, that's their part. You know, they know how they... They move and everything. So, to refer one, you have to have a vision screening, you have to have a hearing screening, motor, 
you have to have a mental disability, okay? And there's no. This is just for your initial. You have to have have all that stuff. So uh, we just have to. And of course, they've got that English limited to proficiency in there too. So we have to look at all that. Look at your cultural factors. If if you're it's an initial if it's initial and you're suspecting SLD, you have to have a motor screening, even though you know that it can move in all parts. Yeah, DD you have to have it as well. You really don't have mm -mm. no not for testing, because you're just going to screen them. Is all you're going to do just a short screener. Yes, this is for anybody, any child in special education. They must have, yeah, no matter what disability it is, they have to have at least two full psychological reports. And then you can do a review of records. Oh, no. It'll go with that. It'll go, you have academics and all that stuff with that. It's just like start doing the first one. Again, these people have to have, these kids have to have adverse effect. So you have to document the same thing here that you have to do in every one of these eligibilities. What is the child that you suspect already got? No. Mm -mm. Only one that you have to have is DD and uh, SLD. And that don't really make any sense to me, but they probably know more than I do. Oh, I need to tell about that. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. I'm going to explain that. No. All right. She just asked a very good question. What if she had a child tested for SLD and they didn't make the tables? Can she go and do the RTI method? No. Be, what you have to do at that meeting, the initial meeting, when you're going to do the referral, you have to determine which method you're going to use. The ARC has to determine which one they're going to use. So, but you can't have both. You have to make sure you do one or the other. <laughs> you pick the wrong one and you're in trouble, I guess, uh, because you can't, you can't go back and do that. You can't go back and redo at the beginning, the ARC said they're going to do the RTI method, then that's then you can go ahead and do all that. Mm -hmm. But what you need to make sure of is, is everything is accurate in there. And that's, that's sad because it's left up to us special ed to make sure of that. Oh, good. Oh. Okay, so... Stephanie just now said that, I guess you, did you talk to Kelly? Yeah. All right, said that a part of the Vineland that's given covers the motor. So you can take that motor section out and the score, and you can use that as well as a screener. That'll save you from having to do anything else because you have to do adaptive behavior anyway. So that'll help. Thank you, Kelly. <laughs> okay, she, poor little thing, she's sick. <laughs> or she would be right here with us today. Um, all right, so on six, we had the ARC documented the review analysis of evidence uh, confirming the lack of instruction. Here we go. All of them has a lack of instruction in it. So if they've, they've missed a whole lot of days, then, you know, they're looking, it's like, mm, we probably shouldn't even refer them. Probably should have put them through the tiers first and, and went that route. But sometimes they don't uh, do as we ask. But anyhow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's when, and I hate to say it, the, the chairperson needs to say, you know, we've noticed uh, the child, and, and this is what we think of. How many days do we feel like a first grader should be at school? 
Well, you know, they probably need to be there a lot. You know, to me, six days missing is, is bad for a first grader. But now, if you get up in the high school, which we hope we don't get any people, uh, uh, students uh, referred, because we missed them down the line if that happened. But, you know, the older they get, then the, the days would be a little bit less. But, you know, those learning years all the way up to about the sixth grade, you would expect them to be there a lot. It will go into your guidance office with, with their, in their cumulative folder. So they can go back and say, you know, no. If it, it, that would be a no. The, AR, the chairperson has to contact the, the parent and let them know. They're gifted. <laughs> Twice exceptional gifted. See, it's all messed up. That's, that, that don't need to happen like that. And I know the teachers are saying, oh, they're really good kids. They don't cause me no trouble. You can't do that, folks. We're doing them an injustice. So how many days does a student need to get that we would consider as well as this, you know, two months slow? Well, they don't give us a percentage. The state don't even give us a percentage. But what they did say, and they've got this in the, in the guidance document. If you look in the guidance document, you'll see it. The younger they are, the more they need to be in school. So to me, if they miss 10 days, then no, that, uh, that's out. But you're going to find out a lot of them miss 30 and 40 days. Yeah, if they look at the guidance document and read it, and that's the reason why we're giving principals access to our stuff so they can go in there and look. And, and Dayon is there at every one of the principal's meetings, and she goes over stuff with them. Because um, so, we want them aware of stuff that they need. Because missing a lot of days, and the state goes in there and looks at that stuff, and they're like, oh, my goodness, this kid has missed 40 days of school. And I'm not exaggerating. I have seen stuff like that. Yeah, and that's what we need to do. Oh, Lord. Well, you know, when you look at that, if I was an ARC person, I, when you look at that, those are medical problems. We have parents, they're just too lazy to get them up in the morning. And that's, when, that's what you're looking at. But if they've got, the, they've got documentation of why, then there's a different, there's a different view on that. I'd say that happened to a whole lot of people yeah. here. So, but anyway, that's that's different because it is a medical issue. So you won't have any problem with that. No, you won't have no problem with that. Uh, and we do have kids that have to to go to different services too. You know, some of them might have to go to counseling. Some of them, you know, they're in different places. But as long as they've got that excuse, then that's fine. But it's just the parents that don't want to bring them to school and don't think that it's important. Yeah. Okay, so we are over on the second page. On 7A, the ARC documents the relevant behavior noted during the observation. So you know you've got two observations, and you're going to discuss that, and you're going to put that in the conference summary too, okay? This is when you're testing, when you're doing the observations. So it would be an initial or um, a re -eval. Okay, then they document the relationship to that behavior that they saw in class to their academics. They look at and see what, if the behavior is, uh, what it is affecting that academic, the functioning piece. Okay, it says a member of the ARC, and it said other than the student's regular education teacher documents the behavior observation in the learning environment. So we need to have someone else 
other than that regular red teacher. And most of the time, I'm going to tell you who it is. It's you. <laughs> it's you. There's two special ed teachers that goes in there and do, does that. Then the next part is talking about your medical findings. So a lot of times I, we find out they don't fill this out, but they need to ask the parents to stay, all those qu medical questions that is on that. We need to make sure that we document that. They're on medication, all those things. We need to write down the medication, and we need to know the dosages. Do they have to take medicine at school? Blah, blah, blah. We Just a whole lot, whole lot of questions. All right, then you have, uh, ask this again, we have to make sure that we're uh, documenting the review and the analysis of the instructional strategies that we're using. Remember, all kids don't learn alike, so we have to have different strategies, and they need to be evidence-based. They need to be evidence-based. Now, we do have our literacy person in here. Um, Chassie's sitting over here. She's working herself to death. She always does. But she has a list of strategies our math consultant has a list of strategies, and they're there if you need them. And they're in our Google Drives, um, and all you have to do is go into go our Google, and, and you can find those. Again, you have to have all this discussion in your conference summary. It tells us about, you know, discussion those targeted skills, discuss the progress of each of the strategies that you do. Um, any programs listed must be accompanied by a discussion of targeted skills to show the progress. And then we have to make sure that the student's parents were notified uh, of the policies, and that's regarding the amount and the, the nature of the student's performance data. So strategies for increasing the student's rate of learning. And then, of course, the parent's right to request an evaluation. Parents can request. Now, do we have to do it? Well, you can stop and look at a lot of stuff, and if you look at the grades and they're making A's, I don't think I would want to be testing anybody, but uh, we need to make sure that if it's a rate problem, we need to look at those things, and you can just about figure that out uh, just with your assessments that you do, and uh, make sure you document that uh, thoroughly in there, especially whatever their SLD in. If it's math, if it's reading, you know, decoding, whatever. Um, then each ARC member, they have to sign their name. They have to check the box. Do I agree with this or do I not agree with this? Uh, you will be shocked sometimes that there will be a teacher that will say they don't agree. And then you have to have a discussion of all that. And you have to have all this discussion in that conference summary if that happens. Now, if the parent disagrees, it's like... They're an outside agency, but they're really the parent. But we have to make sure that we talk with the parent and we tell them what the child is doing during school time. Now, what they do at home, we don't know. But we can tell them how they function at school and those types of things and try to get them to change their mind. Um, but if they don't change their mind, they can have the right to for anything to be mediated, anything. So... Uh, but if you feel like the child needs to be an SLD, I would stick with my guns because it's all about the kid. It's all about the kid. Uh, the ARC documented uh, how, to, uh, how the above information was provided to the parent. I told you I put that in the conference summary. And then each ARC member, they have to do that in writing. They have to mark the box. And it says if any ARC member disagreed, the differing conclusions are attached. And that's, that they've got a document in Infinite Campus. I don't know if y'all know that now or not, but they do have a document in Infinite Campus that if there is someone that disagrees, they have to complete that form. Um, it says to the eligibility determination form and written report. So you have to, I guess, attach it to that. Okay, on the back, the parent was provided a copy of the evaluation report. Again, if they can't come in and get it, uh, mail it have someone deliver it from school or whatever, uh, do not give that to the child to take on the bus. <laughs> Somebody else's parent might be reading all that. Then we get in trouble. Okay, or if the parent did not attend the ARC meeting, the ARC documents um, that a copy of the evaluation report and document of the eligibility determination were sent home to the parent. Um, a lot of people do a certified mail, so they have to signature that they did get it. And I was one of those because uh, I was always afraid that 
it go in somebody else's mailbox or something. You know, you, it bothers you. So uh, anyway, you have to. Don't, I do it certified. It don't cost that much. Uh, then of course, it, it, again, it's got your your required ARC members, and then it's got the the ones that could be additional people uh, in there as well as a student. So again, everything that you check off on these two, well, really four pages. Uh, you need to have a, a com conversation about that in your conference summary. So your initial and your re-evaluation meeting conference summary will probably be a little lengthy. So just make sure that we have all that documented. All the test scores now you can put this, you can actually put the numerical score and the test that, that went with it. Okay. I know we're slower behind that one. Okay, I'll try to go through the rest of this as briefly as I can. Uh, orthopedic impairment, you know, we have a few of those, and we have to make sure that we have all this documentation. Now, when you have an orthopedic impairment, that you usually have a doctor's statement uh, showing that the child has whatever it is, arms, leg, you know, feet, whatever. It's like Stephanie's feet right now. She's not even supposed to be on her feet for two weeks, but it is what it is, she says. <laughs> But anyway, you all can read this because uh, it tells you about some of the, the different types of orthopedic impairments that, that are here. And like I said, this is not uh, an exhaustive list, so you can actually go through these pieces. And if you'll notice, you see this cerebral palsy piece? Now, a child can be highly intelligent, but they have a hard time uh, walking from class to class or something of that nature. So you'll have to state something about that in your conference summary. Other health impairment, we have issues with that. Um, the State Department uh, has noticed that we have a rise in OHI students and what's happening is they're being tested for a disability like MMD, SLD, and then they don't meet. Then mom comes back next week with a prescription the doctor says this child needs to be in special ed or the child needs an aid or anything of that nature. You have to take it into consideration, but we all know a doctor does the doctoring. We do the teaching. So we don't go in there and tell him how to operate. They wouldn't want me in there. But uh, so he, they can't come in and tell us how we have to teach. But you can look at that and you have to consider it. You can't throw it in a garbage can or anything like that. You have to consider those types of things. But if there's not an adverse effect, then you can't place that child. Now, that child may have enough to be a 504. You can look at that. But when, when you see they don't qualify for special ed, you all have to walk out. They can then have a 504 meeting afterwards, but you're not a 504 person. They have a regular ed, only, has, only two people has to be there is the chairperson and the regular ed person. The parent don't even have to be there, but I would want them there. I, I would not want to have a meeting without a parent. That, that's just kind of scary, but it's legal and for 504. Again, you see these ADHD. Everybody's got ADHD. I think I have ADHD too. <laughs> you know? I'm the hyper one. When you put me and another teacher together in, in, in a room, it was chaos because we both, I think, had ADHD. Well, she's taking medication for it. I wouldn't. But, but anyhow, I mean, you know, if you have ADHD, you, don't, you have it all the time. It don't go away. So you'll notice these kids that they're put in, and then all of a sudden they don't have it, and they want to be out. And then they test, and they're testing something else. So, I mean... I said we do injustice when we don't do the proper and follow our protocol. We've got to follow those guidelines. If we don't, we're in trouble. And we've got so many guideline books out from the state right now that you all probably take the rest of the year to read all that stuff. But it's important stuff. All right, we talked about your learning. Uh, here you go with the speech. So 
we already know through, was it the last training we did just a minute ago about the speech? They could probably put any kid in speech the way it's worded in their, uh, the kegs. So, you know, but they don't want to do that. You don't want to do that. Now, if the child needs it, that's great. But I'm sure you probably have a lot of language students. That's the problem. We have figured out here that our kids don't understand the vocabulary. They don't understand those pieces. So I think if we was to get that to them up front and teach them and let them have a, a log, you know, definition, that would help them and go through those with them. Every time you have a unit, make sure that you go through them and define it. Give them a little quiz. You don't want to give them 100 words. You don't want to give them very many words because it takes a long time for them to learn. And our problem with our MMD students is that they can't retain what they learned today. They forget it. They don't know it the next day. So we have to try to help them and be repetitive with them and try to work with those. And I'm going to tell you, Equipping Minds works. Um, we do that training here. But we did see a child, and um, it works. So I, I feel like everybody should have that, that part, but I understand that they don't. But equipping minds. We train it here. We've got trainers. Yeah, we've got trainers for that. So if you all are interested in that, just get a hold of your director, and they can contact us, and we can set up a date to have the training. Yeah, we do things here. <laughs> We're workaholics, as a matter of fact. She's back there. Look at Chastity. She's back there working her heart out. Okay, again, traumatic brain injury. Um, that's the doctor statement. You know, you don't have to worry about testing because they've been in some type of accident and they've had a traumatic brain um, injury. So we just need to make sure that we do what we can for them because they have a lot of problems. A lot of problems depending on the on the blow that they've had to their head. Okay, so we're wrapping up eligibility, so we need to make sure that we understand those federal regs, those federal guidelines and stuff. So if you'll notice that, I put the, the federal code is right here, and then we have uh, on your paper, we actually have the, the Kentucky regs as well that, that links it to them. But we need to make sure that we do a comprehensive thorough initial placement. We need to make sure we do everything right. We go right by those guidelines that are right there in them eligibility forms. Um, again, if their MMD and their adaptive behavior goes a little bit higher each year, that's fine because that's what we want it to do. We're teaching those skills and they're learning those skills. And I'm going to be honest about it. There's some MMD kids that have a lot of, of just street sense because they raise yourself they raise yourself but we we do know that they they are mmd so we just make sure we put them in the correct category if they go into a category if you feel like you all need additional uh assessments then you know you can say that in that meeting you can say well uh, let's meet at a such and such time and let's we're going to do this assessment, all those types of things. And if you have a behavior kid, make sure you do a Connors or Achenbach or whatever you all do uh, in your school district because that's going to be your assessment for your EBD part. And that's the part that we find that they're not doing. We see those. that We don't have find a test in there, but they, they're EBD. So we make sure we have that Connors or, or whatever test that you all give them. All right, so I put in here a little old thing about specially designed instruction, and it's two slides, but we've already gone over that all day, and you all have been in here. So we just need to make sure that the student gets the proper uh, specially designed instruction um, and the proper uh, supplementary aids and services and accommodations. Those are the three pieces that will help them with their playing, being on, the, on a playing, a level playing field. Okay, we need, again, address that unique needs of the student and the results of the disability. That tells us the, the adverse effect. And then we need to make sure that they're in with the general education um, curriculum so they can learn all that. Plus, uh, we have our IEP that's on top of that. It's a separate, IEPs are separate than being in a regular classroom. So it's just on top of that. Um, and if you all need any help or need any um, questions asked, you know, we're here.